Howard Snyder's The Power of Logic. Logic, logic. Chapter 2, Identifying Arguments. 2.1, Arguments and Non-Arguments. What's an argument in the philosophical sense? Well, it's a set of statements where some of the statements are intended to support another statement. Or, as I like to say, a series of claims called premises intended to logically support another claim called the conclusion. Now, these claims and these statements need to have a truth value to be genuine claims or statements. For example, my cameraman Justin drew this duck is a genuine claim because it either corresponds to reality or it doesn't. It's either true or it's false. If I were to say, Justin, stop drawing on my whiteboard, that would not have a truth value because it's a command, a demand, and so it would not be a claim. If I were to say, Justin, why does the duck have a blue flat top? That similarly would not be a claim because it doesn't have a truth value. So know that actual arguments need to be made up of claims slash statements. However, not every collection of claims constitutes an argument. Examples of non-arguments would include reports, illustrations, explanations, and conditionals. Reports, for example, you might have a history paper where you explain that this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. There's a logical ordering, there's a sequence, there's a temporal progression, but it's not the case that the claims are intended to logically support another claim. They're just given as true. Another example would include an explanation. For example, anytime I teach firearm safety or marksmanship, I like to explain to my students how a semi-automatic weapon operates, just so they know how to be extra safe and extra proficient. And so first thing is you can see that it doesn't have a magazine. And also you do that and look down the chamber to make sure there's nothing inside there so we know it's nice and safe. So I'll tell my students, whenever you push your pistol forward, when you get fully extended, you squeeze the trigger and it goes bang. When you do that, an internal hammer will come down and strike the firing pin. The firing pin will then extend and strike the primer in the back of the shell casing. The primer will then ignite the gunpowder. The gunpowder will explode. The explosion will push the projectile out the barrel and downrange toward your target. That same explosion will push the slide backwards. The mechanics of the pistol will throw out the empty shell casing. The spring in the magazine will then push a new round up into the chamber. The spring in the slide will then pull forward, placing a new round in the chamber, and you're ready to shoot again. This is how any semi-automatic firearm works. Now, this is a, a good, I think, explanation, but it does not constitute an argument. It's not the case that that final step is somehow logically supported by the other steps. It's just a sequence, just a detailing of a phenomenon. However, if someone were to say, Matt, you shouldn't use firearms in your philosophy videos because academics, many of them have an aversion to firearms, rational or not, and this might not be good for your career. Further, students might draw unfounded inferences about your political allegiances, and then you therefore might alienate half your class. For the record, I'm a proud independent and not a single issue voter, so you can't infer very much from the fact that I'm using a firearm and teach firearms, marksmanship and safety. But this would constitute an argument. The conclusion would be, Matt, you should not use firearms in your philosophy videos. And the supporting premises would be, it might be bad for your career. It might alienate students. That's an actual argument. The description or the explanation of the internal operation of a semi-automatic weapon is not. It's just an explanation. 2.2, well-crafted arguments. A well-crafted argument, what's that? Well, Howard Snyder tells us that a well-crafted argument which some would just call a formalized argument, is an argument that is stated in such a way that its important logical features are explicit. And we want to translate the usually cluttered and confused and messy arguments that we get in the real world into a well-crafted, formulated, or formalized format to make it easier to analyze. So we can easy, so that the logical connections are more transparent. So we can better decide whether we should accept the argument or discard it. And Howard Snyder provides six straightforward steps that we can follow. The first of which is to identify the conclusion and the premises to number and order them. And the first thing you want to do is try to figure out which of the claims is the conclusion, which of the claims the rest of the premises or the rest of the claims are logically supporting. And once you've done that, you'll write that at the very bottom and you'll proceed it with the word so. So, blah, blah, blah. This is the conclusion. And then above that, you're going to write out the premises that you think logically support, or you think that the initial author, the original author, intended to logically support that conclusion. You're going to number those. While you're doing this, 
you're going to apply these other steps. Step number two is eliminate excess verbiage. So there's going to be all sorts of stuff that's included in most informal arguments that you can immediately discard. For example, repetition, discounts, assurances, and hedges. Repetition would just be where an author repeats something two or three, four or five times in an effort to persuade you to believe it simply out of I don't know, being overwhelmed. Politicians do this a lot. It's called talking points for them. When you're translating their argument into a well-crafted format, you don't have to repeat stuff that they repeat. Just write it down once. A discount, that's where you, where an author would preemptively respond to an objection in a, a kind of a superficial way. They might say, for example, now CNN is going to object to this or, she, or Fox News won't buy this. However, blah, blah, blah. And they're expecting an objection from someone else. And so they're going ahead and saying on the front end, that I want to throw out their objection, but they've not really done a good job of it. So you can throw that out as well whenever you diagram, and I'm sorry, whenever you formulate your well-crafted -craft argument. Assurances. These are superficial attempts to reassure the listener or the audience that a claim or the overall argument is better than it actually is. They might say, for example, why even a child could understand that blah, blah, blah. Or it's a well-known fact that blah, blah, blah. These phrases have no bearing on the actual quality of the argument, the actual reliability of the premises, so throw that stuff out. And last, hedges. Hedges are instances where people attempt to insulate their arguments from criticism, ineffectively so. And the most popular and the most common is, in my opinion. People will say, in my opinion, and then they'll just spew the, the worst, most nonsensical, in many cases, offensive ridiculousness you've ever heard. And they think that since they said, well, it's just my opinion, that we can't engage it and show why it's actually incorrect and why they should instead believe something else. In philosophy, this does not work, and it should not work in politics and other realms as well. If someone says, in my opinion, throw that out whenever you translate the argument into the well-crafted format. Don't use that in your own arguments. All it's going to do is undermine what may be a very good logical argument with a rational appeal and equate it with a baseless opinion, which you don't want. Number three, use consistent wording. And there's a good example from the, the book, and that's the reason we have the duck visual here. And the example of the book is, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then it probably is a duck. And it both resembles a duck and cackles like one. So we have at least to consider the possibility that we have a small aquatic bird of the family and not today on our hands. Contrast that with the much simpler and much clearer, it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, so it probably is a duck. Many times you'll see arguments or hear arguments where many different terms are swapped in and out. Maybe a person's trying to be more engaging in their, their terminology. Whatever the case, be consistent in your terminology when analyzing the arguments. You can better track the logical connections or the, the supposed logical connections. Number five, distinguish. I'm sorry, number four, be fair and charitable. When you're interpreting an argument and it's ambiguous, if the logic or the premises can be interpreted in more than one way, Interpret them and choose the interpretation that is most credible, most powerful, most reliable, insofar as you can still be consistent with and true to the author's original intent. And you want to do this because you don't want to unfairly degrade their argument. You don't want to unfairly challenge an argument that's not really the argument they're making. You want to be able to analyze their actual argument, and then if it's good, be able to say, yes, that was a good argument, we should all accept it, or if it's bad... I'm sorry, here's what was wrong with it. Perhaps we can repair it and, and, and argue something else. But in any case, we don't want to commit what's called the straw man fallacy. And the straw man fallacy is fallacious reasoning because it's an instance where a person intentionally interprets another's argument in a way that will make the interpretation easier to defeat. So rather than saying, here's what you've actually argued, let's look at it together in a transparent, collaborative fashion and a cooperative pursuit of the truth, they'll say, well, you're arguing this. And what they provide clearly isn't what the person argued, but it's close enough to fool many people. And then they'll shoot down this and then claim they've shot down the actual argument. Don't do that. It's very common. It's a very misleading thing. Philosophers do not operate in that way. Our approach is not to win. Our approach is not to show that we're necessarily correct. Our approach is not to defeat our opponent. Our approach and our goal is to uncover the objective truth, and we can only do this by being transparent and straightforward in our argumentation, and to do so in a cooperative, collaborative fashion, and not a competitive, manipulative fashion. Number five, distinguish sub-conclusions. Now, you already know that the actual conclusion, the ultimate culminating conclusion, goes to the very bottom, but there could be intermediate conclusions that happen somewhere above in the argument, and then that intermediate sub-conclusion then supports the ultimate conclusion. When you're crafting in a well-crafted argument, 
you want to put so before both the ultimate conclusion and also the, the sub-conclusions, but only the ultimate conclusion goes at the very bottom. And I'll give you an example of this in just a minute. And last, number six, make implicit premises and conclusions explicit. There's an example from the book that Howard Snyder uses, and he says this is a bumper sticker that, that he's seen, and the bumper sticker says, abortion stops a beating heart. And he argues that there is an actual argument here, but there's a premise that's implicit and the conclusion is implicit. The, the implicit premise is that anything that stops a beating heart is, is wrong, and the implicit conclusion is that abortion is wrong. If we want to analyze this argument, the first thing we need to do is to make that implicit premise and also the implicit conclusion explicit, to state them, such that we can then look at it and ask ourselves, is it really true that anything that stops a beating heart is necessarily wrong? Is it the case that abortions always stop a beating heart? We would need to talk more to, to figure that out, but the first step, again, would be to identify and then make explicit those implicit conclusions. Last, section 2.3, argument diagrams. Another technique you can, you can use that complements well-crafted arguments or the translation of regular arguments into well-crafted format is diagramming. When you diagram an argument, you bracket the claims, assign numbers to them, and then represent their internal logical workings with arrows and plus signs and underlinings and other symbols. For example, if you have an argument where you've got a premise that supports the conclusion directly, it goes bam from here's a premise to here's a conclusion, you just draw an arrow. If you have more than one premise that does this in a similar fashion, you do the same thing. If you have an argument where premises have to work together in order to support the conclusion, then you would use a plus sign and underline them to show that, hey, two and three aren't going to independently support one, but together, jointly, they do. And in this case, this argument had another premise also supporting the conclusion independently. And if you have sub-conclusions where an intermediate conclusion then becomes a premise that ultimately supports the ultimate conclusion, you just simply draw an arrow to the subconclusion and you put the ultimate conclusion at the very bottom. That's argument diagramming, but that was very fast. All this was very fast, so let's apply it to an actual example. We're going to work through this one together. This is an argument that someone offered to me in the real world just last week. Israel normalizing diplomatic relations with the United Arab Emirates may destabilize the Middle East. Israel already has a decent relationship with Egypt, and Iran might feel more isolated with another Arab neighbor recognizing their biggest rival. As a result, Iran's more likely to spark conflict. Now, the first thing we want to do is bracket the, and number the claims. So the first claim here would be Israel normalizing diplomatic relations with the United Arab Emirates may have or may destabilize the Middle East. And we'll put brackets around that and give it the number one. The second claim would be Israel already has a decent relationship with Egypt. So we put a bracket around that and give it the number two. Here, oh, I'm sorry, and should not be bracketed. Got ahead of myself. Iran might feel more isolated with another Arab neighbor recognizing their biggest rival. This would be three. And last, as a result, would not be included, Iran's more likely to spark conflict. Now notice that I excluded and, and also as a result, because these phrases and these words don't contribute to anything to the claims that they're near, don't, don't contribute anything to their truth value. So that's the first step, number them and bracket them. The second, second step would be to ask ourselves, and this is missing the number four, ask ourselves which of these claims seems to be supported logically by all the other claims. There seems to be the culminating claim that the rest are trying to give us reason to believe. So let's, let's consider some of these. Israel already has a decent relationship with Egypt. Do the rest of these claims give us any reason to think that Egypt, or I'm sorry, Israel already has a dis decent relationship with Egypt? No, they don't say anything at all about Israel's relationship with Egypt. This is just stated as, as given. What about Iran might feel more isolated with another Arab neighbor recognizing their biggest rival? Maybe there's some, connect, some loose connection here somewhere, and it seems like this, this claim right here somehow works with this, but it doesn't seem to be supported by everything else. But what about this one? Iran's more likely to spark conflict. It does seem to be the case that there is some reasoning here that gives us reason to believe that Iran is more likely to spark conflict. However, it's not obvious that this is the overall culminating conclusion. In fact, if we consider this first premise, or I'm sorry, this first claim, Israel normalizing diplomatic relations with the United Arab Emirates may destabilize the Middle East. Middle East. The destabilization of the Middle East seems to be a larger, broader implication that Iran being more likely to spark conflict would feed into or support. And so I propose that the intended conclusion in this case would be this, which would be one. And so the first thing we're going to do is put a one 
here at the very bottom. And then we're going to go back and act, ask ourselves, how do these other claims support that ultimate conclusion? One, well, Iran's more likely to spark conflict seems to directly support it. So we're going to put a four right here and then draw an arrow straight down to the one. And now we need to ask ourselves, how do two and three support four or one? Do they go directly to one? Do they go directly to four? Let's read the statements. Israel already has a decent relationship with Egypt, and Iran might feel more isolated with another Arab neighbor, recognizing their biggest rival. It seems to be the case that Iran being more isolated, or feeling more isolated, uh, uh, with another Arab neighbor recognizing their biggest rival is only relevant because Israel already has a decent relationship with Egypt. So it seems to be the case that these two claims work together. They need to be combined in order su to support something else. And the thing that they seem to support is for Iran's more likely to spark, con spark conflict. And so the way we would diagram that is we would simply put two plus three and we would underline it and then draw an arrow down before. So now we have the whole argument diagrammed. One is the ultimate conclusion. It came at the beginning. Conclusions can be anywhere in an argument. You have to just read it and figure it out from context. Notice that there's no therefore or thus or, or conclusion indicator here. We just had to figure that out. It's supported by four. Iran's more likely to spark conflict. And four is supported by two and three working together. So that's the diagram. Now we can use this to now develop a well-crafted argument, another way to analyze argument. We know that one is the conclusion, so we're going to put it at the bottom. Israel normalizing diplomatic relationships, etc. So at the very bottom, we're going to put so four, and we're going to put four rather than one because it's here at the very bottom. These, these numbers only correspond to the diagram. So for Israel normalizing, is that an S or a Z? I don't know. Normalizing blah blah blah. That's at the bottom. And we know that this statement right here, Iran's, Iran's more likely to spark conflict, comes right before. And we know that it also serves as a sub-conclusion. So it has an arrow coming to it and an arrow going from it. But when it's represented here in this formalized fashion as a well-crafted argument, it should be preceded with the word so because it is a sub-conclusion. So we put so, comma, three. And here the three has nothing to do with its number here, but instead with its order in this format. Iran's more likely... Y'all hear my frogs? Aren't they beautiful? They sing to us. They enjoy our philosophizing. So we know that's the sub-conclusion. And then for one and two, we know it's just these other two statements. So we've got one, Israel normalizing. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not the, not the premise right there. My bad. One would be Israel already has. Dot, dot, dot. And the other one would be Iran might feel. There you go. That's a lot of material. But these are some techniques that I think can help you. Can help you unpack and better examine arguments you're going to hear from politicians, from talking heads, from people on television and the internet. Doing this takes some practice, but these are some really good steps, some excellent advice from Howard Snyder. Diagramming, you can make it more or less complicated. In some cases, it'll be questionable as to which diagram is best. And you even noticed whenever I diagrammed this argument that I had some internal conflict as to whether or not this would be the ultimate conclusion or this. I think we had good reason to think that this is the ultimate conclusion. But in any case, use your best judgment as you do that because the point is to simply better illustrate and better make transparent the argument's logic so we can make better decisions about whether to, to accept them or reject them. Thanks so much.